seems kind of weird not having the big pulpit here for me to hide behind, but <laughs> but when we have the little kids sing, it's good to see them too. So I, I always enjoy that. So it's worth the effort to put it back there and bring it back because they're such a joy to, to have in church. Well, our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Acts, the third chapter, beginning of the 12th verse. Hear now these words. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And that faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect help in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I love this Sunday story that this such story about a little Sunday school class that a teacher shared. She had a little girl in the class and one Sunday school morning, this little girl got to class and she, her hands were just all dirty. Her dress was all dirty and she had this strange brown ring of dirt around her lips. And this just confused the Sunday school teacher. And so she asked the little girl, what happened? And the little girl said, well, she was on her way to Sunday school and a neighbor boy asked her to blow up his wading pool. So she got down on her hands and knees and she huffed and she puffed and she blew and blew until she blew his wading pool up. And then the boy picked up the hose and started to fill the pool up. And she said, you know, I asked him, why didn't you come to Sunday school with me? And he responded, no, I just want to play in my pool. And then with her pretty blue eyes looking straight towards the teacher, she said, I pulled the stopper out of the hole. <laughs> and I stomped on the pool to let all the air out. Until the pool went down, because if he didn't come to Sunday school with me, I didn't want God to blame me. <laughs> now, I'm not sure if this is what it means to be a witness for Jesus Christ, that this is how we win people to Christ. But we are called to be witnesses to our faith. And in our lesson this morning, we, we get a glimpse of being a witness. Peter and John were going to the temple to pray. And as they're going into the temple and pray, they encounter a crippled man who's lying there by the entrance and who's begging for people. And as he's going in, he gets Peter's attention. And Peter and John walk over to him. And Peter says, look at me. And this guy's thinking, okay, I'm going to get some money. Someone's going to help me out this morning. And then Peter says, I don't have any money for you. I'm sure the guy kind of felt deflated at that point, was probably ignoring them and started to turn away. But as soon as Peter says, I don't have any money, but what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he says, walk. And at this, the man got up and he walked. The man who had been crippled for so many years now walked. And it gathered this huge crowd of people around who are amazed that this guy's up and walking. And this is where our scripture lesson picks up with Peter saying, why are you surprised at this? This should not be a surprise. And he repeats the shortened version of the Easter story by saying, you know, you handed, over to, you handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to God and you killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. And then he makes a profound statement and says, we are witnesses to the faith. We're witnesses to that. And the Greek word for witness is the word martis. We get the word martyr from it. 
So a witness for Christ is a martyr. So when I tell you we're all witnesses, you're really ready to go now, right? (laughs) Well, it actually didn't start out meaning one who gave their life. The original meaning of the word martyrs was a legal term. It was a legal term for the witness who could provide reliable facts to the case. And that's what its most common use was. Aristotle and Plato would use the term to mean witnesses to a greater truth. But the term in the early church then began to be used for the apostles. And finally, the term in the church was used for anyone who died for their faith, just them. And the question some have had today is, though, can we still rely on the apostles' witness? When they say we are witnesses to this, can we still rely on that today? Is their witness still credible today for us today? Well, I think if we look at how they lived, how they lived their lives after Christ's death and how they died, we can kind of say, yes, maybe there is a a case that their witness is still reliable for us today. See, when we start looking at the lives and how they died, we begin to see that both Peter and Paul were both martyred in Rome around 66 AD. They both died for their faith. And they were killed during the persecution of Nero. Paul was beheaded and Peter was crucified. And Peter was crucified upside down at his request because he didn't feel he was worthy to die in the same manner as Jesus Christ. Andrew is said to have traveled as far as what is part of the old Soviet Union. Christians there claim him as the first to bring the gospel to their land. And he also preached in Asia Minor and modern day Turkey and in Greece. And it is Greece that he is said to have been crucified there. Then there's Thomas, who is probably the most active in the area east of Syria. And tradition has him preaching as far east as India, where the ancient Marthoma Christians revere him as their founder. And if you travel there a few years back or 20, 30 years ago, you found a lot of Indians named Thomas. And it's because of this influence that they have of Thomas being their patron saint. And he also preached in... um, And when he was there, it's claimed that he was speared by four soldiers. And that's how he died for preaching. Uh, Philip traveled to Carthage in North Africa and then into Asia Minor, where he was he converted the rife of a Roman proconsul. Well, the Roman proconsul did not like that. So he had uh, Philip arrested and then cruelly put to death. Matthew, the tax collector and writer of the gospel, ministered in Persia and Ethiopia. And reports say he was stabbed to death in Ethiopia. Bartholomew had widespread missionary travels attributed to him to India with Thomas and then back to Armenia, then also in Ethiopia and Southern Arabia. And there are many different aspects because we're not sure how he died, but almost all of them say he died a martyr. And then James, I mean, Bartholomew, he had travels. I just did Bartholomew, excuse me. James, son of Altheus, is reported to have ministered in Syria and Jewish history of The historian Josephus reported how he was stoned and then clubbed to death. Simon the Zealot, so the story goes, ministered in Persia and was killed after refusing to sacrifice to the sun god. Matthias, who was the apostle chosen to replace Judas, was traveled to Syria with Andrew and was killed by burning. James, the son of Zebedee's death is recorded in the New Testament in Acts 12, 1 through 2, where it's revealed that he was executed with a sword by the order of King Herod Agrippa about the year 44 AD. Thaddeus, also known as Jude, was crucified in Edessa around 72 AD. And even James, the brother of Jesus, we know that Josephus in his history says that the high priest had James killed because of his work in Christianity. And that was one of the few references to Jesus that's not in the Bible was by Josephus. And John is the only one that we don't have any tradition that he died an early death, that he's the only one who lived to an old age. And why I bring up, why I bring up this whole list of all these, pe- all these deaths they had, they were early deaths. And many of them were deaths because they refused to not deny Jesus. They could have saved their life just by simply saying, I denied Jesus. But they chose not to. They chose to die instead. And see, that's an important thing because they didn't die for a lie. They knew the truth. They knew the change. For us, it's faith. But for them, they knew whether it was faith or fact. They knew it was fact because they were with him. I find it interesting that when Paul was put on trial and he had to go before King Agrippa, 
He could have given some wonderful speech, of which he did sometimes, about how he's a Roman citizen and he's got this behind him and got this behind him and he could get out of it, but he wouldn't have proclaimed Christ. Instead, when he went before King Agrippa, he shared his own transformational story. Because Paul realized the greatest witness is a transformed life. And that's what he wanted to share, not what kind of citizen he was. And so that's what he shared. And in the past hundred years, as you look at some of the people that have given their life for Christ and the missionaries, I think one of the most profound ones and dramatic was the one that happened in 1956 where five missionaries, Nate Smith, Jim Elliott, Pete Fleming, and Ed McCulley and Roger Yurden were brutally murdered in the Ecuadorian jungle by members of the Wadani tribe that they were trying to reach. These five men had gone there and they were doing things over a period of time to try and to make contact with the Wadani tribe. And when they finally decided to meet them face to face, they were killed. And this is the story if you've seen the movie at the end of the spear or read the book, The End of the Spear. What happened next was the family comes back and goes to try and reach them again. And this just really baffled the Wadani people because they live by a code of revenge. If you kill one of my kin, I'm going to go kill one of your kin. So it really made an impact on them when all these relatives came back and said, no, we love you. We want to bring peace. It was able them to convert. And that was a powerful thing for the Wadani people. There's a James, man named James Boster. He's an anthropologist at the University of Connecticut. He's not a real big Christian type person. But he's just an anthropologist who studies these things. And he studied the history of the Wadani revenge murders. And this thing and concluded that the Christian conversion prevented self-extinction. What he means by that, he said they had... He said that these deadly cycles of revenge had scattered them into small, small factions. Attempted truces had failed because their language had no words for ideas such as peace. And he includes because Christianity was brought by kin of people they had killed, but who befriended them in return, it became a powerful way to signal commitment to nonviolence. And here's the impact that it had on the Wadani people. In 1958, there were only about 600 Wadani people living. By the year 2000, that number had grown from 600 to 2000 because they stopped killing each other. They started living lives of Christ. But it only came through the blood of those five who gave their life as a witness. And then their kinfolk came back and continued to witness William Woodfin made this observation. He says, the proof of Christianity is not a book, but a life. The power of Christianity is not a creed, but a Christian character. And wherever you see life that has been transformed by the grace of God, you see a witness to the resurrected Jesus. And these people who died for their faith knew that death was but a temporary thing. They knew that it was simply a transition in the joy of heaven with Christ. They lived the words that Paul wrote to the Philippians. See, Paul in Philippians was writing to them. He says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I go on living in the body, this, still, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. See, those first apostles, they knew the truth of this. They ate with Jesus. They watched him heal people. They watched him raise Lazarus from the dead. They watched him be crucified. And then they watched him be raised from the dead. And after he's raised from the dead, they ate with him. And so when someone says, deny that, they said, no, I'm not. Because I know the truth of it. And so today we can stand on their witness even 2,000 years now. Because we can live as witnesses in our own way. There's a song out there that many of you will probably like. So if I destroy your 
this song for you, I apologize. It was written by John Lennon, and it's called Imagine. And it's a very melodic thing, and it lulls you to peace as it brings out all these ideas. But if you ever take away the music and just read the words, it's not very good. It's some, he's imagining some faraway land where nothing happens. Everybody's just living for today. Well, I think we're living in a culture where everybody is living for today. And is living for me for today. There's nothing living for the future. And there's one phrase in there besides not believing in heaven or hell. There's a phrase there where he brings two ideas together. And that's a subtle thing that people are making arguments to convince you of things do. He says nothing to kill. Which is a pretty good thing. I mean, that's a good thing. Christians, the early Christians believed there was no reason to kill. So if you were drafted in the army, you go, but you just don't kill, which is an interesting place. But nothing to kill. But then he adds two words, or a few words after that. He says, nothing to kill or die for. To the Christian faith, nothing to die for is a slap in the face. Because Christians, even today, 10,000 a year are dying for Christ. And what I've found is if you don't have anything to die for, you don't have anything to live for. What is passionate about to you? If you go to anybody who teaches young people, they're not living for today. They're living for the future because they're investing in the lives of young people. When I lived in Gainesville, I, some of the people I had spent their whole lives researching a cure for cancer and they didn't know if it even find anything in their lifetime, but they were dedicating their life to that for the future. It wasn't about today. And see, as part of our witness, we have a, have a passion of something to live for, which means we have something to die for. Jesus Christ. That's the witness we stand on today with the apostles. They thought of nothing of dying for Christ and his message. There was no place, no people, no scenario that they felt they would avoid to share the gospel. And even when confronted with the choice of saving their life or denying Christ, they, they chose to lose their life. That's their witness to us today. And that's a witness we can trust on. Because they knew the truth of it. They were truly martyrs. Legal witnesses to the event. And for that, we can still stand today with them. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for so many blessings. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your peace. But most especially, Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the power he gives us, the spirit he gives us. And Lord, for all those who have lived and died before us, for those who have stood the faith, help us to walk in their, their footsteps. Help us to live for you by being able to die for you. To die to all the things we want so that we might live for all the things you want. Lord, we can only do this in your power and your spirit. So send it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.